I can tell you right here and now, in about 30 seconds time, there's going to be agony and ecstasy of the highest order in sport. Wickets falling here and there. We need a wicket, we take a wicket. All of a sudden the game's even, then New Zealand are ahead, then we're behind. Is this it? Is this it? Oh, he's thrown it, he got it! He's got it! It's six! While the ball was in the air, I was watching it thinking, that's out. And the game's over, we're done. That's out of the ground, is it? Is it out of the ground, it is! Because guys were <laughs> throwing things around calling Stokesy a ginger ninja, come on my son, come on Josh, they're absolutely, they're losing it inside. They're going to push, are we in for a super over, they've got to go quick, they've got to go quick, out, I'm sure he's out, we're going to a super over. After we'd finished the game, I, I, I said it to him, I, I couldn't hold it in, I said why didn't you hit the ball for six? Gattol's going to push for two, they've got to go, it's got to throw, it's got to go to the keeper's in. There were more experienced internationals. There were older options that you can could have gone to. Why Joffre? He's got it! England have won the World Cup by the barest of margins! The team ends up pretty much in the sort of mirror image of their captain. And I think the New Zealand team are a mirror image of their captain, Kane Williamson, who's a fantastic guy. What a way to end the game. Truly remarkable scenes. What an incredible time in our, in our life. Hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us and to our viewers around the world. Uh, we hope that things are going well. We have a special edition of our Cricket World Cup look back, given that it is the one year anniversary of the 2019 Cricket World Cup in England. And I've been really blessed to have the company this morning uh, of the Cricket World Cup winning captain of England, Owen Morgan, has graced us with his presence and also blessed to have the former England captain and now world-class broadcaster, Nasser Hussain, with us, gentlemen. Good morning and hello to you, Owen. Are you warm? Morning, Vish. Yeah, um, yeah I suppose I am. It's um, Even when you you sort of say that, it still really hasn't sunk in yet. It's only been a year. But what an incredible time in our, in our lives, especially given probably the last few months that the whole world is, has gone through. But yeah, it's it's extremely exciting that the last couple of weeks for here for us has been getting back into cricket and hopefully we'll be back into it sooner rather than later. So very excited about that. Now, it's always a pleasure to be in your company as well, having having heard that sound resonate um, about Owen and, and the achievements of the England team. Where does it sit with you? Oh, right to the top. If you give it context of where England have been in their white ball cricket, you know, people were asked at the start of last year, which would you take, an Ashes win or a World Cup win? And it showed how far Owen had changed the mindset of the country and how bad we'd been in white ball cricket, that a lot of people had said, <clears throat> give us a World Cup win. And that is in a context where the Ashes is one of the great things in English cricket. But Owen Morgan's side winning that World Cup from where they were four years ago when they trundled off in Adelaide against Bangladesh, knocked out of another World Cup, disappointingly, um, to be there. And also not just the win, the manner of the win. That day at Lord's Bish, you were there. Um, it was a special, special day. It was one of the great days of cricket, not just English cricket, great days of cricket. It was an absolute privilege to be there. Don't go for hero. Goes for hero, bowled him, full and straight. The Bangladesh Tigers have knocked the England Lions out of the World Cup. One of the greatest days in Bangladesh cricket history. One of the lowest points in English history. Owen, just touching on what NASA said there, let's go back to that 2015 World Cup and England leaving after the group stages. Talk to us about the journey from that point up until that World Cup win last year. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think NASA's always good for bringing it up. He's, he's always <laughs> right on the money. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it actually, it, it actually played a, a hugely significant role in where we are to now and the relationship that English cricket has with T20 and 50 over cricket because I think for a very long time uh, our 
opinions and, and thoughts about uh, where cricket is going and the direction it is have been extremely dated and it took being humiliated in 2015 um, where we went into the World Cup number six in the world, our win to loss ratio away from home was terrible um, and we were playing in a, in a dated form of the game um, and evidently we, we, we got absolutely hammered up and down Australia and New Zealand and didn't deserve to be anywhere near the latter stages of the group. And when when you have such a significant um, public humiliation, um, I think it gives great or, or presents great opportunity for somebody to come along and change things significantly. And I think one of the, the, the most significant appointments uh, following that World Cup in 2015 was the uh, appointment of Andrew Strauss as our managing director of cricket. He came in, he'd, he had actually um, seen firsthand what had happened at the World Cup and obviously being a huge part of English cricket and, and, and recently out of the changing room could relate to what was going on as a, as a player and recognise the, the need for significant change within the group and change of mindset, change of direction um, and, and change of personnel. And for a guy to come in in such a a prominent role and make changes as quickly as he did I thought was a, a huge step in the right direction and that that was really the start of it um, from there Trevor Bayliss was appointed uh, Paul Farbrace was kept on and I was kept on as as captain which I, I, I really do feel lucky to be kept on at that time because it's it's an easy decision to get rid of your captain at, at that time and have a complete change of mindset complete change of voice in the changing room um, but having done that and, and being given the freedom to start with a blank sheet of paper trying to identify where the gap was between the top four teams in the world and where we were at after that world cup in 2015 was actually brilliant it was it was fascinating because you talk about having a, a dream team so it could be any names across any teams and you talk about having potentially a left arm seam or a guy that can swing the ball or an out and out quick, a wrist spinner, uh, your top six or seven being able to play with a huge amount of freedom and, and a, an aggressive brand of cricket that, that teams don't like playing against. And that for me and, and for all the coaches and selectors were, was extremely exciting because we got to experiment with new faces and, and, a, and a refreshed looking team. Um, and, and sort of from there, being given the freedom to to allow guys to go out and make mistakes um, with the purpose of, of trying to bridge the gap for the first couple of years um, in the lead into the 2017 Champions Trophy. Um, and I think it, it very rarely happens where um, the, the, the players and, and the coaches are empowered in such a big way that they respond pretty quickly. And, and we've we seen that with the group of players that were selected. Uh, we didn't win anything in the first couple of years, but the, the, the significant strides that we made were showing or giving giving us enough ev evidence that we were going in the right direction, which is which is the key, really, because the goal was 2019 World Cup at home. Huge opportunity, not only for the game, but for us to try and, and be contenders for that World Cup. Um, so sort of... After that Champions Trophy in 2017, where we were beaten in the semi-final by a, a very strong Pakistan team, because of the nature the guys had been playing in the first two years and the honest feedback that they've been given to themselves and the direction that we wanted to go, knowing that we had, had a long way to go still, guys learned a lot from that. Um, because in a way, we played on a, on a uh, wickets in the first two years that had been fantastic. We, we, we were a high boundary scoring side, high run scoring side that were dominated by the bat and playing on a wicket that was a little bit slower and, and one that exposed our biggest weakness allowed us to actually spend a little bit more time focusing on that over the coming months um, and giving our game a bit more of a rounded feel to it. Um, because if, you, if you're trying to win a world tournament where there's there's only 10 teams so it's going to be unbelievably competitive and the skill level is going to be extremely high 
you're going to have to show different strengths and attributes throughout the whole tournament. Um, so sort of progression from there was that. And then, and once we started to improve um, our, our, our play on slow wickets, trying to get that level of consistency in the lead into the World Cup was extremely important for us. Now, there, there were some, I suppose, some slip ups along the way, and, and you'd expect that in a learning process. But I listened to you intently over the course of that period between World Cups. And when those slip ups did come, you did not sort of move away from what you thought England's philosophy was. You thought it was the correct way to go. Yeah, only because of the bloke on screen there in Owen Morgan, actually. You know, I always go back to the Aegeus Bowl. England were playing New Zealand and they were bowled out in 45 overs. And I, as you know, Bish, you go down to do the presentation and you still hear the commentators up in the studio discussing before the presentation. And they were discussing the old cliche of bat your overs, always bat your overs, bat the 50 overs. So I felt I should ask Owen that as my first question. And I put it to him, Owen, were you not disappointed in the fact that you didn't bat the overs? And Owen Morgan being Owen Morgan just brushed me aside and said, Nass, that is old school. That is not what we're about. If that's what we used to do, I need to change that culture in this side. And it's one thing saying that, and you hear that from certain captains and people, and you think, ah, really, he doesn't mean that. When you hear certain things in those four years from Owen Morgan, you knew he meant it. And more importantly, you knew the team meant it and were listening. Never forget how much a team listens to interviews and anything that's said. They listen intently. And when Morgan and Bayless throughout that period never put a single bit of doubt in their philosophy, never once, and they could have done, there were slip-ups, there were times where you thought, really? You could have just knocked this around and won this game easily, but no, you took the attacking option. Um, so I give all credit to Morgan and Bayless for never doubting that philosophy, so much so that all of us wrapped up in it, in the game, thought, you know what? They got this absolutely spot on. But I'd say on top of that, two things. Selection. Some of those players were there. They just weren't being selected. In English cricket, test match players were being rewarded for their test match form. Oh, you got 100, you can go and play in the white ball side now. It's like after the Lord Mayor show, you can go and play in the white ball side. Owen Morgan, Trevor Bayliss and the selector said, well, hold on. It's a completely different format. We are going to produce and select our best white ball players. So they came in, Roy, Bairstow, Hales, etc. They came in and started the trend. But also the point that Owen mentions, there was a little period where they played on pitches where they couldn't get 400, couldn't smash 350. They had to be smart on top of their attacking instincts. And that little period was perfect for a World Cup where everyone presumed that scores were going to be 350, 400 when actually scores were 220, 230, 240. So England were not only dynamic, they were smart as well. And just, Owen, that, that whole dynamic, uh, that synergy between yourself and the coach, Trevor Bayliss, what was that like? Yeah, I, I, I thought it was awesome. I thought it was a, a relationship that, that worked really well. Um, sort of previous to Trevor being appointed, we, we'd been at Calcutta, uh, night riders together for two seasons in the IPL and we thoroughly enjoyed each other's company but I think more importantly we we got on um, and it was sort of right from the get-go the two of us are, are pretty honest characters and, and get straight to the point when we're talking or trying to make make a point um, so building a relationship with him sort of didn't take long at all because it already existed and once we sort of ironed out where we wanted to be and what the goal was, so ironing out your strategy, it was just a matter of putting a plan in place uh, along the way. And, and Trevor was happy for, for me to take a, a front seat majority of the time and, and for the, the changing route to be led by players or so a group of senior players that were um, easily identifiable because they were the guys who were, had been playing for quite some time. Um, were empowered to take on decisions and to take on opinions that would empower the rest of the change room. So when it actually came to crunch time in a game, guys felt felt comfortable making their own decisions uh, and backing them. Um, but I think, obviously, 
saying that, like NASA said, similar to selection, saying and doing that are two completely different things. When you're a new coach coming in with, with such a, a prestigious reputation, particularly in white ball cricket, it's the hardest thing to do is actually to sit back, listen, observe, and then when the time comes, ask good, strong, solid questions of your team. Um, and hopefully you get honest answers in return. And if you're not, you continue to, to ask questions. And I think that's where TB was, was excellent. I suppose the burning question is, is where does all this go? But I, I want to revisit first, and I know, Nas, you, you want this as well, that, that fateful day of the 14th of July, um, 2019, and how that played out, uh, Owen, just just revisit that for me. You said you don't. You're not sure it, it sunk in yet. What stands out to you on that day? I think, as a whole, forgetting the the, the the super over part of the day. As a whole, the day was it was quite a tense and busy day for me um, and for all of the players. I think there were watching. I suppose the game would have been a fascinating game to watch because it was probably like watching the final day of a the last game in a test match series where the everything was on the line but the game never slipped out of anybody's grasp so it was extremely tense um, i think the wicket made it uh, tense i think it it brought the sides where i suppose going into the game there, there was nothing between the sides but Having played on that wicket, it just showed that actual, in actual fact, there was uh, literally nothing between them. So, I suppose right from the toss, and Nasser was at the toss. He he watched it all unfold. It started to rain about 15 minutes before the start, before the toss, which makes your decision whether to bat or bowl that much more difficult. Um, and at Lords, when the sun's out, you always bat. But the wicket that day was was soft. For some reason, it, it didn't harden up. Um, so I was probably a 60-40 chance to bowl first. Um, so going out, you you want to have made decisions already prior to the decision uh, arising as a captain, just to, just so you can think about different things. So that actually preoccupied my mind a lot um, on the morning of the game and right up until it happened. Um, and then from there, it's just a matter of matter of trying to get guys as comfortable as possible and into the game and um, so we can try and play the game that that we had been playing in the three games leading into the final um, but the, the the biggest thing that stands out for me past you know wickets falling here and there we need a wicket we take a wicket all of a sudden the game's even then New Zealand are ahead then we're behind the biggest thing that stands out for me is when Jimmy Neeson, I think it was the 49th over when Jimmy Neeson's bowled at the pavilion end and he bowled a slower ball to Ben Stokes. And I'm sitting on the balcony um, and to hit to the pavilion end is the, one of the longest sides on the ground. And even to hit to the grandstand corner is one of the longest corners in the ground. So when Ben tries to slog a ball for six. Slower ball. Now then. Now then. Over Long On's head. I'm watching the trajectory of the ball on the balcony and you can see it's like a golf ball. You can see it. You can see how far it's gone, where it's gone. And you're like, oh my God, that's out. And for a split second, while the ball was in the air, I was watching it thinking, that's out. And the game's over. We're done. Ben gets out. That's, that's literally it. Slow ball. Now then. Now then. Let's tread bolt again. Is this it? Is this it? Oh, he's thrown it. He's got it. He's got it. And I've le leant over the balcony to have a look, and I can't quite see what's happened, but I can see Martin Guptill. He collects the ball, and Martin Guptill turns around and goes six. Is this it? Is this it? Oh, he's thrown it! He's got it! He's got it! It's six! And the relief in my head was that we're back in the, we're back in the game. That is, that is the one biggest moment in the game that, that sticks out during the whole day as if... Trent Paul catches that, we're dead and buried because Ben isn't there the next over. There's no overthrows. Um, we have um, Adil was at the other end. So Adil and then Mark Wood coming in needing, well, potentially it would have been more than 16 in the last over, 15, 16. Mm -hmm. um, but that that's the biggest moment in the game for me. What were you like on that balcony? 
Morgs, you are the ice man. And we kept panning to you on the balcony and you were, you know, emotionless as you always are with your facial expressions. What were you thinking? Were you churning away inside? Not churning away. I think having Liam Plunkett sit right beside me uh, actually really helped because he's he's still involved in the game. He still has to bat. He's 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 quite a, a nervous guy before he bats anyway. So being conscious of Liam being beside you and the language that you use was the completely opposite to what was going on in the, in the change room because guys were <laughs> throwing things around, calling Stokesy a ginger ninja. Come on, my son. Come on, Josh. <laughs> Absolutely, they're losing it inside, and I'm just I'm having the most boring conversation with Liam Plunkett about, yeah, okay, uh, if we get, if we, we need a boundary now, what do we think? Yeah, that's fine. We'll still be there at the end. Um, so it is, it's acting like that for me does not work. So acting like Nasser Hussain does where he's high and low and very emotional guy when he plays. If you ever see me playing like that, you'd be like, right, he needs to get the sack and should never play international cricket again. When I go back and play club cricket, I might choose to play like that. Um, but it, it just doesn't work for me. Um, hence the try and be logical about things. But the, that was pretty much it. Um, I think being in the change room would have been far more excitable as a, as a fan. Goes again. Can he give the strike away? This is a big moment. They've got to run. They go to the other end. Oh, he gets in the way. This is going to go all the way to the boundary off the bat. Can you believe this? It is. I do not believe what I've just seen. I can I ask you two questions here, actually? One, we were scuffling around in the commentary box trying to work out the laws, the rules, the super over rules, the five or the six. When it hit Ben Stokes' bat and went over the boundary, did you know if it was a five or a six, first off? Well, typically, as a player, I got it wrong. I said it was a six. <laughs> So as soon as he hit his bat, I wasn't sure if it hit the footholds, the keeper, because you're on the wrong angle from the home changing room. And I'm watching it. I was like, that's hit something. And you, yeah, um, Colin de Gromholm backing up, sort of turning like the Titanic, trying to uh, run and chase the ball. <laughs> and I, I just automatically, I said, that's six. That's, that's six, 100% that's six. Um, and they gave it a six, and I was wrong. Um, but like most players, you, you do get it wrong. Here's Bolt. They're going to push. Are we in for a super over? They've got to go quick. They've got to go quick. Out. I'm sure he's out. We're going to a super over. You are kidding me. You are kidding me. And then on the, la on the last ball, Ben Stokes, he gets that low full toss. Now, that, for that moment sort of typifies everything we've spoken about in the four years. Dynamic cricket, smart cricket. As captain, what would you say to Ben there? Dynamic cricket, just belt it out the ground, win the World Cup. Smart cricket, stay in the game and ask that fielder to run you out. Which option should he have taken? So, yeah, I think so. one of the things that we tried to help the players along with was to make their own decision in the moment at that time over the course of the four years, um, just simply because we find it is the quickest and most effective way for that player to learn. And if the player learns himself, under pressure, he will deliver and back his own decision. It's not a second thought. It's not conferring. You don't have to convince anybody. So over the course of the four years, guys were empowered to make their own decision simply because if you're a guy who has the ball in his hand or the bat in his hand or you're out on the boundary wondering whether to come in 10 yards, you are the best guy to judge at that time. Unless there's a skewed decision or you've not really been up to date with the game, you are still the best guy to make that decision because you make it yourself, you convince yourself, and even if it's the wrong decision, you can still make it work. So at the time, sitting on the balcony, I would have said, Ben, that's the ball you've been waiting for for the last two overs to hit into the mound stand for six and we win the game. But what summed Ben's form temperament and experience throughout that day which shone through unbelievably um in a high class way was his answer after after we'd finished the game i i, I said it to him I, I couldn't hold it in i said why didn't you hit the ball for six 
And he said, well, I was thinking if I chip it either side of um, deep mid wicket or long on, we win the game. We run two and we win the game. If I miss hit it, we get one, we go to a super over and we still win the game. And that's, that's unbelievable when it comes down to delivering your skill, making a decision under pressure. And it, it turns out it was the right one. Um, I think that's a great example for any young player around in a position that they don't know what to do. You, you're better off making your own decision because constantly in a game, you're taking in all this information and making decisions based on the information. So fair play to Ben. It was incredible, absolutely incredible what he did. You're now thinking about the super over. How is your thought process there about who's going to bat and who's going to bowl? I suppose for the last couple of balls in the 50 over game, uh, me and TB exchanged a couple of words about it being a super over and potentially what might work. Now, I think on a normal day, on a very good wicket, you would send out your, your biggest hitters. You'd try and get a left hand, right hand combination. But because the wicket was so difficult to middle the ball on, and very few guys had spent time in the middle, we felt that Joss and, and, and Ben were two obvious candidates. And actually the more difficult decision was who to send in after that. So um, I said, I'll, I'll tell Jason to put his pads on, but full well knowing in the back of my head, and TV's head that I was thinking, I, I need to get out there, like hitting to the short side down into the um, mound stand as a left-hander is a lot easier than hitting up the hill at Lords. Um, so then I went to put my pads on and then after two balls, I told Jason that I'd go if we lost the wicket. I, I suppose Nasser's second pad there was Joffre Archer bowling. Uh, he played, what, 10, 12, 13 one day internationals before being chosen to bowl that super over. There were more experienced internationals. There were, I suppose, older uh, options that you can could have gone to. Why Joffre? Yeah, I think... The obvious answer to that is that he is one of the best death bowlers in the world. Uh, I think one of the advantages we have um, in modern day cricket is that guys are exposed to absolutely everybody in the world in high pressure circumstances in tournaments around the world. And Jofra has proved at the IPL, the big bash um, for Sussex in the blast that he can deliver under pressure. And although he had only played maybe a dozen one day internationals at that stage, every challenge that he had come up against, he had thrived and become became, become better as a a person and as a player. Um, because I think for a young 23, 24 year old, being mature enough in, in what you do is an extremely important part of performing under pressure because you need to be comfortable with the decisions that you're making. So actually, Joffre tells Joffre tells a story that I went up to, or he went up to me and said he hadn't got his bowling boots on, he wasn't ready, and we were just about to go out to bowl, and he asked me, was he bowling? And I sort of laughed when he said it to me, saying, ha, 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 that's great. And then I was like, we, we batted first here. And then the first time I actually watched the game back, watching Joss and Ben bat, the camera pans to sort of the outfield and Joffrey's on the outfield practicing his bowling while we're batting. So there's quite a lot of tax on that story. Um, <laughs> but part of the conversation about the, who was batting um, after I'd spoken to Jason, uh, I then sort of walked in the direction of Joffrey and Joffrey actually, I, he was behind me and he tapped me on the shoulder. I was like, Morgs, it's me. And I was like, yes, mate, it is. Um, so he was like, sweet. And in typical fashion, he just took it within his stride. Yes, it's him, turns around, game face on, knows exactly what he's done. I met him down on the outfield after we batted. And as a captain, when you're dealing with, I think, not dealing, but when you have one of the best bowlers in the world at your disposal, you just want to steer them in the right direction. Um, and, and, and myself and Joss got together and we sort of, agreed it had to be Yorkers, but obviously Joffre's um, choice and, and 
decisions on this would would have a huge impact and i i simply asked him what's your best ball for this situation and he said my yorker we're like great that's that's exactly what we want to hear it's the best ball um and then continuously throughout the over it was just about asking him what's his best ball trying to take time out of the game um making sure he's composed and not just turning around and bowling without thinking about it um and he was he was unbelievable i think the best Best example, and it's similar to Ben chipping the last ball, the 50 over game down the down the wicket, thinking clearly, is after Jofra gets hit for six, um, we 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 thought we needed a wicket, so we changed what we wanted to bowl. What was your best ball to try and take a wicket? Jofra said a bouncer, perfect. He bowled one of the quickest bounces in the world. So he tried to bowl a bouncer, didn't quite get it up. Uh, Jimmy Neesham's clothed it to cover, mm. and Jofra sprinted, picked the ball up and picked it up to, to throw at the stumps and held on to the ball. If he throws at the stumps and hits and Nisham is in or he misses the stumps, we're out of the game. It's a, then a tie. They need one off one. It completely changes the, the, the dynamic. And Nisham is back on strike. So having the clear cut, sort of cool <laughs> decision maker in the back of his head, in the highest of pressure situations, I thought was awesome. Uh, and not a lot of people realize it because it's just, it's it's one off the over um, and then that's it. But you have Guptil facing his first ball since maybe 11 o'clock that morning in a, in, a, mm. in a must win sort of, not must win, but two off one with England's best bowler bowling. Guptill's going to push for two. They've got to go. It's got to throw. It's got to go to the keeper's end. He's got it. England have won the World Cup by the barest of margins. By the barest of all margins. So it's an interesting one, Bish, isn't it? Talking about the Joffre decision. It's an interesting one on Owen and his leadership because some leaders, some captains in that situation will make the decision of what looks least bad if it goes wrong. So he could have easily gone to Chris Wokes, who's experienced death bowler, because you go to Joffre Archer and say Joff freezes, <laughs> he might do. Owen will say it's a no-brainer, Archer is not going to freeze. Archer could freeze, inexperienced World Cup final super over, gets it horribly wrong. What would we be talking about a year later? Owen Morgan gave the ball to Joffre Archer. What mm. a mistake, should have gone Chris. You know what we're like as broadcasters, wise after the event, give it to Wokes. But Owen saw something in Jofra and didn't take the easy option, is my point. The easy option there is Chris Wokes, the one that makes Owen look OK if it's Chris Wokes if he gets it wrong. If Archer gets it wrong, it's Owen Morgan that messed up an England World Cup final. So I thought that was incredibly brave. Another brave person I want to talk about, if I can, Owen, is Ben Stokes. Ben Stokes winning that game for you that day. You know, a few years earlier in Calcutta, some clown on commentary is shouting, remember the name, remember the name. <laughs> what about Ben Stokes? Was that Ben Stokes' redemption? How pleased were you for him? Uh, unbelievably pleased. I think probably since 2016, you know, that, that final was, again, under extreme circumstances. Uh, Ben's bowling the, the, the last over of a World Cup T20 final to a guy who is a is a really good cricketer, but up until then hadn't hit consecutive um, more than consecutive sixes in a in a T20 international and hits four to win a World Cup final. So it's an incredible achievement for that player. But when you're on the other side of it, the context you need to look is is, is quite logical and, and factual about it. Um, yes, we didn't deserve to win the game, but if we'd have executed a little bit better, um, I don't think the captain helped him out at the time. The captain at the time was trying to take time out of the game, but when I look back at the footage, a lot of the time I, I don't. I, I like so in between balls, I like to try and hold on to the ball for as long as I can, speak to the player, making sure you're getting a response and they're listening, um, and and nothing groundbreaking. It's just taking time for the guy to breathe clear his head and then apply himself to exactly what he's trying to do. But in that final, I ran over to Ben. I chucked him the ball. I possibly had a couple of words that lasted three or four seconds. And at the time, I probably 
felt it was probably 10 or 15 and that was enough to turn things around. And I think when you look at sort of the improvement from there to the final last year, I think I took more time speaking to Joffre than I would have done to Ben. Um, and hopefully that would have helped. Um, but I think as a player, particularly with the scrutiny that I think international cricketers are under, a lot of players in 2016 after the over Ben Bolt would not have come back uh, as strongly as Ben. Maybe not even have played again. It might have ruined their career. But Ben Stokes being who he is, uh, who is a fighter, is an unbelievably talented guy who just wants to impact the game the whole time. One thing people don't know about him is he's extremely inquisitive about cricket. He's an extremely smart cricketer. He's always interested in what other people are doing in order to try and grasp things. And then he pushes himself to the maximum the whole time. And I think having that as an attribute, like really has contributed to the progression that he's made over those um, two and a half, three years. And he's, he's now become one of our best ever cricketers. And it just goes to show if, if you continue to learn and, and apply yourself in the right way that works for you, what you can achieve. Uh, I think you only have to look at Ben. I want to try, I'm preparing NASA because I'm going to go to Kane Williamson and what he must have felt after his decision at the toss and, and the outcome of the game. But I'm not going to let Owen get away with talking about taking time out of the game and talking to your bowlers. And what he said to Joffre after that first delivery of a super over was called a why, which I have to say from my vantage point, sitting next to NASA in the commentary box, I differed with the umpire. A wide, it is a wide. It's a freebie for New Zealand. It's pressure on a young man. Yeah, Morgan's got to play his role here. Joffre Archer, that was a wide. Morgan's just got to keep in control. Quiet word every now and then from the skipper. Well, he's going to go to field at mid-off. I think that's a good move. He's just swapped with Joe Root. He was in the covers. He's got to go to mid-off because he's got to help him out through this. That's surely a wide. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Depends on who you ask, really. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing about bowlers. About batters, if you're out, you're out. You, you don't, so you sort of brush them aside when they complain about it. Bowlers will complain the whole time, right until the day <laughs> they die. This is not a wide. I would have taken so many more wickets. Why is that fielder out of position? What is going on? Um, with John, looking back at the uh, at the, the first ball of the over, obviously it's, it's right on the line, so it's borderline. But the umpire calls it a wide, so we need to move on. So I've run over to Joffre and Joffre is saying, Skipper, refer it, refer it. It's a wide, it'll be overturned. We'll get, we'll get the decision back. And I, I had that little bit of a moment thinking, what? What game is he playing here? So I was like, no, I'm not going to stand. So I had the ball in my hand. I walked back to the end of his mark with him. And he was like, I'm fine. I was like, what is your best ball? And he goes, Yorker. I was like, perfect. Jam it in. Yeah. But even coming back from that, there are so many small battles along the way that he had to overcome to and improve on. Whereas I think previously, if, if you're thinking a little bit like the decision Nasser was talking about, about to, to give him the ball, if you're thinking, I'll play it safe, I'll go length, or I'll play it safe and I'll go slower ball, and you change your mind, I think that contributes to execution as well. But the clear... Mm -hmm thought pattern that Jofra had, I think made it easier for him to go back to. And obviously the skill level that he produces is just, just incredible. Nas to you first, and then Owen can take it up, but how much sympathy, um, how much admiration are we to have for Kane Williamson and his team, uh, given the start and the ending of that, that contest and the way that it panned out? A huge admiration. But to be fair, I think the England boys and Owen said it at the time. Two lovely sides. Honestly, that day, that's what made that day special. There was no animosity between those sides. Two captains that had huge respect for each other. If it had gone the other way, Owen and his team would have reacted the same way. But we'll, we'll never know that. But we do know that Kane Williamson and his team have been brilliant in their reaction. 
Kane Williamson at the presentation was brilliant. Kane Williamson, when he was told he was man of the series, ICC had a man of the series, and there's a great clip of it where the lady goes up to him and says, you're man of the series, and he mouths, what, me? That just sums up Kane Williamson, the bloke, thinking there were 20 other cricketers that should have been man of the series. He did the press that evening, and he was so humble in defeat that all the press corps stood up and gave him a standing ovation. And he could have complained about so many things. He could have complained about the five and the six. He could have complained about, you know, the loss, um, how lucky England were. And I think Owen will admit on the day, the rub of the green went with England. But to this day, you know, Jimmy Neesham has a little bit of fun on social media talking about super overs. England and New Zealand with Ian Smith on commentary seem to have a super over every single week, to be honest. And there's a bit of banter about it. But I have not seen anyone really, not New Zealand-wise, complain about it. They've got on with it. And it's a great credit. A team ends up, like the England team with Owen Morgan, a team ends up pretty much in the sort of mirror image of their captain. And I think the New Zealand team are a mirror image of their captain, Kane Williamson, who's a fantastic guy. I'm, I totally agree with Nasser, Bish. I, I said it in the press conference after. I think New Zealand, certainly coming into the World Cup and, and after the World Cup, are a side that we would like to replicate um, in the way that they play and the spirit that they play because they've, they've been doing it for... It's nearly two decades now since since they've sort of initially been competitive and then consistently either got to semi-finals or finals. But regardless of the team that they've had pre-tournament, they've always competed and yeah, undoubtedly been contenders for a World Cup and done it in a, in, a, in a fashion that makes them, you know, come out as as people that your kids would want to aspire to be it's uh, it's easy to say but it's it's new zealand is a great place to tour because it is full of great people and i think the black caps epitomize that they embody what it is like to be a new zealander and kane is at the forefront of that because he is such a unbelievably gracious human who understands that the world doesn't revolve around cricket or sport and it's about bigger things about being a good person and i think before that they had brendan mccullum and then before that they had dan vittori and then stephen fleming um, and when you look at english cricket you would say particularly white ball we are newcomers to this we're newcomers to not being judged just solely on results and performance and i think over the last four years we've we've tried to establish a little bit of that but I'd emphasize again, we're only at the start of that journey that hopefully will go beyond um, mine and NASA's years alive, never mind in the game. So mm -hmm. it's, it's an important thing to recognize the manner in, in, in their defeat because it's, it's hugely admirable. Can I just throw in another New Zealander, Bish, if I don't mind? The, the, the whole game is about the players. We know that as broadcasters. The players are the most important thing. But it being in a World Cup, to call a World Cup final moment, Ian Smith called that moment absolutely brilliantly. He could have fluffed his lines, he could have got it horribly wrong, but it is one of the great bits of commentary you will ever, ever hear. It's going to be on Martin Gupto. Two to win. Gupto's going to push for two. They've got to go. It's got to throw. It's got to go to the keeper's end. He's got it! England have won the World Cup by the barest of margins! By the barest of all margins! So you've got a final, you've got a Lords final, you've got a super over, and you've got Ian Smith on commentary saying by the barest of margins. If you could make a day any better, Ian Smith made it better with that commentary line. Don't tell him that. Not brilliant. <laughs> I'll be on WhatsApp to him as soon as I'm finished to get you back for the club who said remember the name uh, four years ago. Um, <laughs> where to now? Where to now for, for English cricket? What do you gentlemen feel that meant for future generations? And, and where does the game, how does the game go forward now in, in that white ball component? 
Owen? Yeah, I, I think the lessons that we've learned along the four year journey that we've been on is is that you, you can't take a back seat or uh, be hesitant in prioritizing things. So if there's all of a sudden a feeling now that we've we've won a trophy and things will be rosy, we can just go back to what we were doing pre 2015. I think we're, we're, we're sorely mistaken. I think things become harder um, because we've, we've paved the way now, but it harder in the sense that we have to remain consistent in the, the different way in which we do things. And I think that, that becomes the challenge. I think over the last two years in particular, um, with the ICC T20 World Cups on the horizon, there's, there's two of them. Um, we've actually grown and developed a lot of players because T20 cricket has taken a back seat, whereas now it needs to jump into the front seat and really take control of things. And I think the priority still remains that. Um, and I think an easy decision for us would be to go back to, um, I suppose, given the four years of test cricket that we've had and the, the progression that we've had was, has been great, but probably in, in the public's eyes is... is um, not as acceptable as, as the white ball stuff uh, would be to go back and emphasize, oh, yeah, we want to prioritize this. But I, I, I genuinely feel like pushing things forward should be a priority for, for all formats. I understand that you cannot win everything, but prioritizing two out of the three is, uh, I think, important. Um, not only to build on, on last year's success, but to continue inspiring new young generations of cricketers. Because last year really did do that. We've, we've been to schools and hospitals and, and, and to cricket clubs up and down the country where kids of, of all different faiths, races, religions had a hero. And that, for me, not only was, was uh, eye-opening, but a, a huge reminder to the, the roles certain people play within our team that they don't take for granted, but just they get it right and they need to continue to get it right going forward. Split captaincy, Nasser, you, you, you had your time with that issue when, when you were leading. Now Joe Root is the test captain. Um, Owen has the white ball component. Um, how beneficial, just talk, Nasser, from your own experience of how you see that bridging. I think it's working perfectly, actually, because there's no real crossover. Um, Owen, you know, is focused completely on white ball cricket. It'd be interesting to know from Owen, actually, after that World Cup, how close he was to saying it's not going to get any better than this. Did he ever think about saying, right, I've had my time, I'm retiring right at the top? I'm pleased he hasn't because his form actually has been magnificent. Either side of that, he's batted brilliantly. So he's still at the top of the game and he's a wonderful captain. So uh, I couldn't think of anyone better than taking us on in white ball cricket. And Joe Root looks like he's turning it around in test matches. South Africa tours, an excellent win away from home. If anything, the debate really has shifted to split coaches. I think split captains, everyone has worked out, is absolutely fine. But coach's life, he's on the road 24-7, 365 days of the year, You know, albeit not the last few months, but in general. So whether you need just to give them a little bit of a rest and have a split coach. But Owen, did you think after that World Cup, did you, for how long did you think about maybe I should go at the top and what made you carry on? Yeah, I, certainly after any significant period, you guys both know this, having retired yourselves, you need to ask yourself honestly, are you still offering something to the team as a captain and as a player? And I think the the, the, the overriding feeling that sort of, hovered across those two decisions was um, surrounding my, my back, the injuries that I had with my back. Um, because towards the middle and end of, of the World Cup, I, I really did sort of limp across. Um, and it does restrict you to certain shots. You don't react. as Well, you react, but your body doesn't react to how you want it to. Um, but having taken the time to make that decision and then be reassured that moving forward, um, I can manage um, both my risk to injury and um, contribute to performance as well. Um, I, I, I was quite clear in the way the next couple of years looked and really wanted to continue on. That hunger and desire and clarity that I had pre-World Cup was there post-World Cup. So it actually ended up being um, a good decision. 
just just to wind things up, um, you know, the memories of that, even from a Caribbean perspective, there were people around the world, people in the Caribbean were so just wrapped up in in the way that final played out, the greatest final in, in World Cup history. Um, as, as we look now at the entire history of the game, Owen, are we in good shape? Is, is, are things going forward across and speak broadly about cricket? Is cricket heading in the right direction? Yeah, I think cricket is heading in the right direction. I think moving forward, um, like I mentioned before about prioritising things, um, uh, the ICC obviously with the, the new Test Championship have prioritised that as a, as a way to move forward and grow Test match cricket. Um, and obviously with the World Cups being recently more successful probably than they looked maybe 20 years ago as, as you know, they might not hang around as, as long has been an extremely positive thing in, in cricket. And I think when you look at, at world cricket as a whole, the, the hunger and desire for people to watch cricket, particularly after this pandemic, is going to be through the roof. So I think it presents a huge opportunity, um, not only for England and the West Indies being one of the first uh, series back on TV, but also domestically as well. It, all the kids up and down the country are going to have their eyes on every single ball that is being bowled next week, uh, which makes it unbelievably exciting. Um, I think it's going to be an, an extremely great series to watch given the context of what happened the last time. Um, both in the West Indies and here at home. So I would say cricket is in a, a really healthy place moving forward. I think, like I mentioned, prioritising how things go will ultimately uh, formulate in how things evolve. And I think having boards backing decisions from the ICC is, is an important part of that. Now the final word is yours. You just can't do that. We just can't do, go without you giving your parting words of advice and encouragement as to, to where we are, to Owen, and put everything in context for me. I think it's been, there's more important things than the game of cricket. There have been more people and people have died from this horrible, horrible virus. But one of the shames cricket-wise was what happened last summer. That was a great day at Lord's. That was a great win. It was a win that England were hoping, praying, England fans were wanting for so long and then you follow that up a month or two later with the Ben Stokes innings at Headingley in a fabulous Ashes series and it's been, cricketing wise, one of the blows from this pandemic is that we haven't been able to just jump on the back of that this summer. The fans that would have got excited, the young boys and girls that got excited. We were there, Bish, with 85,000 people at the MCG for a women's World T20 final. And that seems like a lifetime away. Everything was shut down after that week here and in Australia. So um, cricket was on a real upward curve. And I would say all credit to the ECB, the West Indies Cricket Board and the Pakistan Cricket Board for trying something different, for buying into something different, because we love this sport. We love the game of cricket and we're going to have to do things differently for a while. But that's because uh, we want to see some live action. There's only so many highlights and watch alongs that we can do we want to turn up to we want to turn up to a game and not know the result and not know who the heroes are going to be yeah i think that's has had enough of zoom interviews well put over now. <laughs> thank you very much for your time um and for what you've expressed to us owen we really appreciate you taking the time to join us and to share your experience with us today i think the cricket world is richer for you two gentlemen expressing your thoughts with us this morning thank you very much that's all we have for you on our special cricket world cup look back we hope you've enjoyed it look forward to your company next time